yesterday, the hackathon. And so please welcome on stage now Jeff and Sabrina to find out more about the results. Awesome. Now, most of you, like I, I can say most of the crowd, already knows that we had a hackathon for the first couple of days. This is technically, they call us the first day of CloudFest. It's actually kind of day four for us because we've been here since Saturday. The hackathon is something we do every single year, and we're going to start by giving a brief introduction. Sabrina, tell us about the hackathon. Yes. I would like to start say hello to everybody here, and um, I would start with introducing the organization team. We are three people to the right side. We have the wonderful Jeff Hardy, <laughs> <laughs> who is our host and good soul of the hackathon. And then we have David Yardin, who will be on stage later. And he helped a lot with um, moderating the hackathon. Myself, I'm Sabrina Walls, and I'm from One and One. I'm one of the organizers and sponsors. So the last weekend, we had our third annual hackathon, and it was, like always, a great, inspiring experience. But we changed some things. And one of the biggest things we changed was the concept. We used, in, in the last years, we used um, um, sponsors to create the projects, and then developers would work on it. But this time, it's different. The sponsors stepped back and gave the developers the chance to define their own project ideas. So they had a chance to submit their ideas and later vote up which of these ideas should find their way into the hackathon. And the result was great, as you can see. Um, we had 45 developers here from all over the world, most of them from Europe and all the most of them from Germany. And um, we had six open, six, uh, open, open source projects and um, people from the open source communities as well from hosters, ISVs and software providers. They all were sitting together and working on the project. And this time, you really could see there's a difference. Because when you entered the room, you could feel the, the enthusiastic atmosphere between the hackers. So they were really focused work, working on their, on their use cases. And they were exchanging exchanging their knowledge and sharing their results and helping and learning from each other. And I think this is always something very special in a hackathon because in real life, most of the people are competitors or work for competing companies. But you forget that when you're here in that hackathon because people became friends. You can say, since the last three years, there are always some people who always come back and work together. And among the developers, there are friends now. But I would say, even among the developers and the sponsors, there are friendships now. Yeah, and from my side, I would say this is something very valuable and a great aspect of the hackathon. And we should keep that. And yeah, we are keeping on changing things and make the hackathon even better. And one could see with the one change of changing the concept, it also changed the way how people work together. They were more concentrated, they were more fo focused, they were more motivated and attached to their projects, and at least they were more, more mm, effective with the outcome. I overheard a conversation between, between two um, developers, and the one said to the other, wow, if we had done this project in our company, it would have taken for weeks to make it done. 
And here, we just did it in one weekend. Yeah, and I don't want to talk too much because we have the people here who can explain what they did and can show us the cool results and all the innovative stuff. So this is another improvement we did. It's not the sponsors anymore who are here on stage and present the hackathon results, but it is the developer themselves who are going to be here and who are going to show what they've done. Wonderful. So I'm going to introduce the first product project for us. But you know, a little side note as well, these are real projects. Sometimes you've gone, I don't know if you've gone to a lot of hackathons, but if you go to them, the projects are test projects. These are real projects that are going to be used in real production environments. That's the goal. And it contributes to the real open source community. So it creates value for everyone. So let's welcome our first project. Let's see if I can do that. Boom. There we go. Please welcome Robert Wittish. OK. Um, we, had a, uh, we had a small project um, which uh, started with uh, help from, a, from an external sponsor. So we did the um, security uh, check for plugins for the WordPress repository. So we, uh, the idea is to automate that, to simply scan all the plugins in the plugin repository for, the, for WordPress to uh, improve security. So the first thing is, what is static code analysis? We, uh, the sponsor which uh, provided help was Rips Technology. They are a um, Germany-based company, and uh, code analyzers is you analyze the complete PHP code, and the software understands the code, where um, people, uh, where um, user input happens, and what will, um, uh, will be changed with this, with this uh, code. So that's why we uh, use them, and they are like um, working with um, open source projects. Um, coming, we're coming to the um, um, explanation what, what, something, what some of the stuff is. Um, some of these plugins that I now show you are um, currently live code on WordPress.org, on the plugin repository, used by some, what, like 100 and 500,000 um, active sites. So we, like, mask the code that you not really see what a plugin is. For example, uh, right here you see the uh, MySQL query which will be executed directly on the servers. So as one of your uh, hosting uh, clients can, can use this plugin and is currently active and people could use that um, to change some things. The next thing will be um, to upload code, to simply upload PHP files on server that use these plugins. So, for example, on this side, um, you can decide what kind of file you want to upload to the server and then later execute the file directly. And um, the other thing is the funding, the um, direct code execution. So you can simply, um, um, that could simply be used to directly access a server and let them execute page, PHP code. Um, and the example is that you have the evil, which is a, a PHP function to simply run every code, and that was used by this plugin and is not really protected outside of this plugin. So, but to say positive news, um, the most plugins in WordPress directory are uh, secure. Uh, some of these um, things we find, um, we, contact, we contacted the plugin authors, we are in contact with the plugin repository team, and um, most of the things will be gone like in a, in a few days. So that's why we, we mask the tools because they're currently not fixed. And the, the best thing we did was um, we built a um, PHP tool that can be implemented in an automatic process when uh, new stuff get uploaded to a plugin directory or for the WordPress core or for um, extensions for Joomla or Drupal. So um, that tool can be used by other uh, projects because it's open source and we'll be um, um, discussing things with the uh, RIPS technologies later on. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Next will be Project One, Francois Sarman. Please come on stage. Hi. So I'll be talking about the project we've been working on. 
So um, the project is uh, ProFTPD that you may or may not know. So um, the goal of the project was to add a um, one-time password from, for ProFTPD. So this is a YubiKey and it contains an OTP thing that you can use and we've been working on that. So problem statement. We have a um, nanny who loves cats and who wants to upload a website. So she uses FTP and sends our login credentials, which is valid, so the FTP response. But at some point, if an attacker managed to eavesdrop the traffic and play the credentials again, then he managed to get logged in as well, which is bad. So um, now our nanny is given a YubiKey. So when she logs in, she logs in using her login and the password given by the YubiKey. So of course, the authentication works as well. Now our eavesdropper, again, is managed to take the credentials again and replace them. But this time, it gets refused by the server, which is awesome. <laughs> so, maybe? Yes, a few technical details. So, um, we've got the clients sending credentials to the server, so we can see the username. So, afterwards, the server requires the client to send the password, I mean the OTP password, at some point. Maybe? Maybe not? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, the OTP is required, so the client forwards the request to the YubiKey by pressing the button. And the YubiKey responds with the password, which is forwarded back to the server. After that, the server make a query to the authentication provider in order to validate the certificate, and the query is done, and the access is granted. So, we made a small video. Look at you. Yes, thank you. So, um, we have created a profile for ilovecat.com, which we're going to connect. The password is prompt. So we press the YubiKey and the authentication work so that we can upload the index and refresh the page and we got our index. So basically the proof of concept works. So what we've been doing, we have um, containerized everything from the development to the integration tests and stuff like that. We have modified a mode, um, mode, sorry, the authentication, the OTP mode authentication module for a ProFTPD so that it supports YubiKey and we ate pizza. <laughs> so, um, because the proof concept works, it's not yet a project, so if we wanted to make it a project, which we will, um, here are some things we have to do. First, create a dedicated module for a YubiKey and tweak the configuration of ProFTPD in order to get some things um, parameterized, such as the, uh, the authentication server and things like that. And of course, we'd like the project to be upstream. So this is us. Um, we've been working with um, one and one guys on the left side from Germany, from UK, and I work at OVH in France. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very Thank much. You. You know, it's, it's remarkable how many companies and websites are still using the old original version of FTP. It's crazy. crazy. Whoa. Now, if you will, project three, please welcome Michael Klein, or Mikael Klein. Am I doing okay? All right, I'm doing okay? All right, there you go. So, hello. Um, so, our project was about auto-updates because every developer needs, uh, needs a way to really have a process that is safe to make his updates. So our problem right now is that um, online updates are necessary so we can fix bugs that you saw, for instance, in the first project. And we need a safe way because when one of the update server would be compromised, you roll out essentially code injections and SQL injections you saw in project one all over the web. 
So in the case of WordPress or so, that are a, a lot of sites. Um, so our idea was that um, we find a way that the, the update process, if it goes, ah, okay. So our solution was, okay, we want to sign the package that we actually sent to the customer server. So we wanted to have a library that uh, a developer can use and can essentially say, okay, I will sign my update with, uh, with an encryption key and um, I will have a file list that is then validated on the customer client uh, when the update should be done. And uh, on the client side, um, we have a program and a library that is essentially checking every file if it's uh, part of the update and if it's signed by that developer. So um, the idea here is that um, if it works, Yes, wonderful, okay. So the idea is that that should be really, really easy for the developer because we don't want to spend time just to improve our update routine. So um, we have made uh, a FAR that is a CLI tool that is automatically like getting a directory, signs all the files with, uh, with a key. And uh, then on the, on the client side in the code, there is essentially like three lines of code that say, okay, I want to deploy the update in my directory and here's my, my, my public key that every client has and then it is doing all the magic uh, behind the scene. And if the update is, um, if the update is working, not like the clicker. So if uh, a, a plugin gets installed, for instance for WordPress, we made the use case there, then um, the, the public key gets imported the first time the plugin is installed and every update then is matched against this public key. So if something goes wrong and every, even one file is not signed the right way, the update doesn't get installed. So even if somebody goes on the update server and compromises a file, he essentially is in, uh, the update doesn't get installed on the client side. Um, sorry. And you can find the code on GitHub on, under GitHub CloudFest signed auto update. Wonderful. Thank you. So next project will be for David Yarden. So uh, yeah, you might have realized that uh, a lot of hackathon projects had some security relations and uh, that's the same for our project. Um, our hackathon project is related to uh, a German web security project called Cybicos uh, that roughly translates to something like a secure websites and content management systems. It's a project uh, with multiple partners involved. It's the ECHO, so the uh, German Internet Industry Association. It's CMS Garden, that's a marketing initiative um, with uh, multiple open source CMS communities involved. It's the Ruhr University of Bochum um, and a, a startup called Hackmanite. They also do some security stuff and that's all funded by the German Ministry for Economy. Uh, basic idea is to make uh, small and medium business websites a safer place. That's the idea in a nutshell. In order to do so, um, Savikos offers two things. One is uh, that we are offering an, an API, a scanning API, um, where you just fire the domain in question against, and we do multiple checks for uh, do you have a proper SSL certificate? Um, are you uh, vulnerable to the pool attack? Um, do you have multiple uh, HTTP headers in place that have a security impact, stuff like content security policy, um, or uh, public key pinning, those kind of things. Um, we do a malware scan, uh, we check for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, all these kind of things. And um, before the hackathon, um, the process of getting into the Vecos was quite a complex one uh, for our target group, which are basically users without any experience, because they had to uh, create an account at savikos.de uh, at their site there, so far so good, and then they either had to upload an HTML file um, or uh, add a special meter tag somewhere on their site, and that's a real complex task for our target group. So what we did during the hackathon project was making that onboarding process a lot easier by creating plugins for multiple CMS, in this case it's uh, Joomla, WordPress, and Type of 3, 
Um, if you use that plugin, you simply install it within your CMS. That's something that most users can do because they did it a couple of times. And then you more or less just have one big button, which is at my site to Cybecos. And then you'll get the result that you can see on the right side of the screen, which is your current scanning result directly in the back end of your system. So no need anymore to log in somewhere else in order to get those results. The second thing that Savikas offers is a service specifically for web hosts. Um, basic idea is that I, for example, I, I run the uh, security team at Joomla. Um, if I get a notification about a security issue, I normally get that notification up front because it's, uh, it's disclosed in a responsible way. People contact me up front. I start working on the patch, I publish the patch, and people should update them right away. And the interesting question is what means right away in that case? And the, the bitter truth is that if you don't update your CMS-based site within the first 10 hours after a patch has been released, you are hacked. So that's the time window that you essentially have. And um, I, don't th I simply don't see that we get the majority of users to update their sites manually in this 10 hours. So we asked ourselves, is there any technical aware partner on the other side behind the users that we could talk to? And yes, of course, there are the web posting companies. That's what we're doing with the Savekos web host service. Um, we as security teams, we're not only doing the patch, but we're also figuring out is there a possibility to filter that exploit with server-side measures? And if yes, how should such a filtering rule look like? Um, for example, a, a mod security rule in this case. And what we did during the hackathon is we developed a proof of, uh, proof of concept uh, command line tool that automatically fetches those rules from our API and um, pushes them into your local mod security config in order to automate that whole process and even more narrow down uh, the time frame that is required to make the users safe. Yeah, so that's it from our side. Wonderful, thank you Arnold. Thank you very much David, appreciate that. Next up, we have Project 5. Please welcome Arnold Blinn. Hello. Uh, so we did a project, um, actually a number of projects, uh, based on an open standard called Domain Connect. Uh, we had so many people interested in our project and so many ideas. We, we wound up doing three miniature projects. So let me start by telling you uh, what is Domain Connect. So at last year's hackathon, we did a project on Domain Connect as well. Domain Connect is an open standard that makes it really easy for online services, things like website builders or email service providers, to configure DNS when the domain or DNS service is run by a separate company. Now, often these service companies will have users sign up for their service, they'll ask the user to uh, assign a domain name, and then they'll tell the user, go edit a bunch of records, A records, C names, MX records, text records in DNS. And my guess is, is even in the room, half the people don't know what I'm talking about. So Domain Connect makes this easy where the end user simply needs to click a couple of clicks, authorize the changes to their DNS, and the changes are made for them. Uh, this standard is supported by over 20 service providers and almost 15 different DNS providers in the, uh, in the industry right now, including some rather big names in the industry. You can read more about the standard at domainconnect.org, uh, but what were the projects we did? So the first project we did uh, was actually an idea based on last year's uh, hackathon. So last year, we built an example service provider. And that service provider is, in fact, live on the internet. You can get at it uh, off of the domainconnect.org website and see how the protocol works with a domain name uh, hosted by a provider that supports Domain Connect. Uh, and we realized this, this example service was very useful to the community because it allowed uh, additional services to look at the code, download the code on Git, and learn how to implement the protocol. 
So we decided this year we would build a uh, example DNS service. And this turned out to be a little harder than the service, uh, the, the service provider side from last year, uh, because it actually required authentication, it required state. So it's a little bit more complicated, not only to implement, but will be a little bit more complicated for the DNS providers to, to look at the code and consume it. Uh, but we did successfully get it to build. Uh, we successfully built it. Uh, it has a couple of components. We needed a database to store the data for the DNS and for the uh, user authentication. We needed a DNS server because it's implementing DNS, so we used an open source DNS service to do that. Uh, and then we implemented the parts of the protocol, both the API and the UI parts of the protocol. Um, we got it working end to end, uh, and, and, and it was a really successful project. Uh, the second project was working with a team of folks from Plesk, and the team from Plesk, uh, you know, Plesk is a, a control panel to build websites and to host, host web applications. And sometimes Plesk runs DNS as part of Plesk, and, and sometimes Plesk is installed somewhere where DNS is external. So what made this project interesting was the Plesk team uh, implemented both sides of the protocol. So they wanted to implement when Plesk is running but DNS is somewhere else, they wanted to make it easy for Plesk users to set DNS up with an external provider. And conversely, when uh, Plesk is running DNS and somebody wants to attach a service, say uh, Google G Suite email or Microsoft Office 365, which would be a common thing to do, um, they wanted that to be easy for those users. So Plesk implemented both sides of the protocol and again, uh, successfully demonstrated that it would work and uh, I think they intend to finish this and ship this capability. The third project uh, we did um, was using Domain Connect in a slightly different way. Um, I think people may be loosely familiar with a, a problem that, that some applications and businesses face called dynamic DNS, where I may be hosting a server or want access to my server at home or in my small business, but my internet service provider doesn't give me a static IP address for that server. So th this isn't a hosting example, but this is rather, I would call it maybe a tunneling example where I wanna get back to my, my, my home machine. And because I get a dynamic IP from my internet service provider, um, as that IP address changes, it's hard for me to have a DNS entry that lets people, myself or other people, access my home, home machine or network. So it's very standard that people run something called dynamic DNS, where as their home IP address changes, they update some DNS entry in the cloud. And for many, many years, home routers have built in protocols that do this, um, often with Dyn DNS is a company that does this, um, uh, or, or one-off solutions. And the problem with those one-off solutions has been that uh, they're always one-off with one DNS provider, a custom or proprietary API. So what we built was using Domain Connect because it's an open standard, an open API uh, supported uh, across multiple DNS providers, we built a dynamic DNS client that runs as a service in the background of your machine, and when it detects an IP change, we'll run the Domain Connect API to go ahead and update the IP address with the DNS provider. And again, the project uh, was, was successful and worked. Um, so, uh, let me just recap the results of the three projects. Um, all three projects, uh, as I said, were, were really, really successful. They all need a little bit of refinement to get them finished and shipping, but very, very much shown to be viable. The, the DNS example, um, we just need to finish it, and when we do, we'll open source the code up on github.com. The Plesk integration, I think the team needs to go back and and finish it and make it production ready and then it'll become part of their product. And the dynamic DNS application I talked about, the intention is to finish that and ship it as a freely available open source, uh, both in source code form and compiled form uh, as part of the Domain Connect initiative. 
Um, we also got a lot of benefits to the standard out of the hackathon. Uh, I think uh, my last count, I got about three or four different recommendations for small changes and improvements that we can make to make the standard better. Uh, and we also, of course, are always, whenever we do these projects, uh, improve a bunch of things on the clarity in the specification itself. So if you want to learn more, domainconnect.org. Uh, there's also a panel. I'll give a little plug for that at 4 o'clock this afternoon. I believe in this room where we'll have uh, four different people talk from four different companies talking about the standard if you want to learn more. Perfect. Thank you. Next on stage will be Project 6, Marcel Wagner and Michael Sommerer. Uh, trust you? Okay, fine. So I'm uh, Marcel Wagner, in case um, you, you ask yourself. And um, Michael Sommerer uh, is also here and taking photos. So uh, we shared our responsibility. Um, okay. Okay, so. The project name is uh, um, Cloud Service Provider Ready IoT Solution for Small and Medium Business. So you can see here the hackers. Um, and um, yeah, it's, as I already pointed out, a very high quality event. You find a lot of very gifted people to work together. You see here you have people from one and one, from TÜV Rheinland, from Gesellschaft zur Entwicklung von Dingen, for, from IDI and um, from Intel. And we came together to um, solve a problem. And um, this problem is, uh, when you look in the IoT space uh, today, you find a lot of solutions. But the problem is those solutions are all closed or partially closed. Um, but if you want to have something, connect your devices, have a scalable solution in the cloud, uh, and uh, connect your devices and IoT data with services, there isn't anything. Last year, we started already uh, in the World Hosting Days hackathon to uh, develop a solution, which is meanwhile open source, which we called Open IoT Service Platform. So why service? Because um, the idea is to collect IoT data <coughs> in the cloud and analyze it, but the value of this is, of course, only if you can combine it with services. Right? And uh, that was this year. The proof point, so after this is now open source, we said, okay, now take it and apply it to a domain, create an industrial solution, and show how easy it is to connect it uh, in the cloud with services and develop it on the IoT side. So this is uh, what we did. Um, you see, to start with the IoT side, on the left side, uh, we took uh, different uh, devices. It's pretty platform independent. You see devices from the Intel universe, but also from uh, ARM, um, for example, Raspberry Pi. Um, we um, put uh, uh, three frameworks on the IoT device. One, fr uh, one is the agent you need to connect to the Open IoT Service Platform. We used an abstraction called libmra to collect all the data from the sensors, and another framework called Node-RED, which is used to um, <laughs> combine to, to uh, define the flow. What do you do with the sensor data? How do you connect to the open IoT service platform? For example, you can already do some processing. Um, in the middle, you see the cloud service provider part. Here, we have um, the scalable open IoT service platform. And uh, to be able to uh, create services to adapt services, to rapidly develop services based on that. We combined it with the function as a service platform, OpenBISC. Um, and then as an example, we said, okay, um, we have, of course, full access to all the devices, to all the information, IoT information, but let's assume there is a service technical, service engineer who wants to go into a factory and only wants to see the relevant um, information about which devices are here, are there any devices which have problems, can I switch on or off the devices or configure the devices? So for these guys, we developed an additional mobile application uh, with the help of the functions as a service framework, which was very nicely integrated uh, so that you can easily get access to all the information from the open IoT service platform. And here you see some examples. We did it 
um, we combined it, so it's all dockerized. It's now, uh, as a result of this hackathon, it can be deployed, scalable, with help of Kubernetes. So yeah, here you see some impressions. So everything is, has been implemented. Um, and everything was working nicely together. In the middle, you see an example for an IoT device, which has some uh, sensors uh, and um, actuators. For example, the display can be controlled uh, from the cloud. And around that, you see uh, all the components uh, we developed. For example, on the uh, upper left, you see uh, the Kubernetes console, uh, how to deploy the service in the cloud. Um, then on the bottom, you see the uh, functions as a service framework where you can develop little JavaScript or Python snippets, move them, push them to the cloud, and let them uh, create services for mobile devices. Uh, on the right side, you see uh, yeah, the example user interface we created on the mobile device. You can go through the factory and see, you know, is, are there problems? And if there are problems, you can dive deep and see what problems are there, and you can even interact with the device. And, uh, for example, the lower right part is an example for the console where you get access to all the data from the, um, um, of the open IoT service platform. You can configure it, you can define rules, you can see what devices are healthy and, 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 and connected and so on. So, what was, uh, uh, yeah, what was the result? So, the first main uh, observation was actually the open IoT service platform works. How did we see it? Because we could immediately start to develop the service without, um, so the, the IoT guys can start working without thinking about the cloud services, and the cloud service guys can start working without thinking about the IoT devices. A and the mobile device um, guys could also directly start because they work with an API, they work with models of the IoT devices, they actually don't need to know what are the details, for example, on the IoT side, and the IoT guys didn't need to know what, are, what kind of details uh, the, the guys are doing on the service or the mobile side. That was the uh, proof that with this kind of IoT abstraction, you can really uh, develop IoT devices and easily connect them to uh, cloud services. Then we integrated the Node-RED uh, platform on the IoT devices. Um, and uh, we made sure that uh, the open IoT service platform works nicely together with the function as a service framework, so you can easily uh, deploy a, a, a function, and it has all the libraries and all, all the setup to connect to the OISP service. Um, and um, yeah, we used Kubernetes to deploy this, so now you can press a button and then it's running in the, in the cloud. Um, and the local uh, application uh, was also uh, developed uh, uh, with a um, framework from open source, uh, which, is, which is actually HTML5 application and uh, working and uh, giving you all the details and information about the IoT device. The project is open source, um, so uh, it will all move under the umbrella of the Open IoT Service Platform. So we will move uh, all the steps, all the uh, sources we created on, on Kubernetes, on the mobile devices, on Node-RED, and on the changes from the um, Open um, OpenBisk platform. We will all move it uh, under the umbrella of, of this uh, platform and um, use it as examples how to uh, develop further um, services. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you. <laughs> you know, wh one of the interesting things for me on this is that, you know, uh, two of the projects we had this year built upon the successful completion of projects last year. And I'm kind of excited to see what we do for the next year, right? So if you're interested in having your projects worked on or you have some ideas or if you want to participate or know somebody who wants to participate, just let us know at CloutFest. We'd be happy to consider those projects as well. We have a few people we need to thank. We'll start with our, with our, our hackathon partners. It's amazing. These people, nothing would have happened unless these companies hadn't taken and participated and supported the effort. So if you would please, two things. First of all, a round of applause for our sponsoring partners. And most of, these most of these organizations have booths out in the exhibit floor. If you want to do me a favor, stop by and say thank you. Thank you for sponsoring all this. And now one more thing. I want to thank all the developers who participated and gave their weekend up and hang out with us and, and, and ate food and did some code. So thank you to all the developers. 
And I want to personally thank uh, David Hardeen did a lot of work. He was, he was uh, coordinating the projects in the back end, so a special thank you for David. Thank you, David. And now the, uh, the lovely and talented Sabrina, is there anything you'd like to add? No? There? Yeah, I just uh, want to thank you, everybody who contributed, because I see here a lot of people who were at the hackathon and helped and contributed, and it was a great pleasure w to work with you and to have the day with you, and uh, it was very su successful for us. I have to say one more note. Uh, we will provide all the hackathon results, projects, videos, and all the picture, pictures we made on our cloud community. So if you want, you can look it up on oneinone.com slash cloud minus community. And if you want, we have a forum there. You can like, comment, and write a little bit about the experience you had here. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Sabrina and Jeff. And we're really looking forward to next year. Please come back with this great team and this hats. Huh? <laughs> I'm not going to miss out on this hats next year, right? But you're really damn clever guys. Man, I have to admit, thank you so much for this great project. projects. We still have a few minutes before we start with our first um, keynote here in this forum at 10.35. So we're going to have a short commercial uh, part. And our screens here at 10.35, we're going to continue with our first presentation. Thank you. Did Thoughts of Cloud Fest give you one of those warm, fuzzy feelings inside? Is the idea of saying goodbye following one of our events leave you simply gutted? Are you desperate to stay in touch until we open the doors to our next global extravaganza? Well, we've got the answer. Easily connect to our community on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn, and keep up to date with the latest and greatest happenings at CloudFest, as well as all the friends you've met along the way. Join us, it's the next best thing to being there. NamesCon is the place where the domain industry converges for a high-energy, four-day event in the heart of Las Vegas. For 2018, we saw industry professionals from around the world come together to share compelling insights and participate in valuable networking events designed to build new relationships and further their business enterprises. Our exclusive domain auction, which featured some of the most lucrative domains in the world, was, as always, a major highlight of this must-attend conference. Here's an insider tip. Get ahead of the crowds and register for NamesCon 2019 today. Taking place from January 27 to 30, 2019. You just have to be there. And because the early bird always gets the worm, use our special discount code, CloudFest, to save big. Register now, namescon.com. In our industry, it's easy for colleagues to become friends. And as we all know, friends are often the recipe to success. So it stands to reason that because our industry is made up of so many friends, we hold the power to make a real difference in the world. Friendship is and has always been an important element of CloudFest. Therefore, we encourage you to join our CloudFest attendee group on Facebook and become a part of this circle of friends. There you will find a host of attendees just like yourself sharing insights, experiences, and expectations around one of their favorite events. Join today, network, and stay connected. Visit cloudfest.com slash group.